from scriptural Mormonism. Latter-day Saints have chosen the true biblical Jesus. Choose the right Jesus, examined exegetically. I recently came across a blog post by a Reformed Baptist anti-Mormon activist from England, Bobby Gilpin, entitled, Choose the Right Jesus. In this article, he critiques Latter-day Saint Christology on two fronts. 1. The alleged biblical evidence in favor of his Trinitarian perspective of the person and work of Jesus and against the Mormon view and 2. The priesthood of Christ in light of the New Testament evidence which, in his view, contradicts LDS teachings on the priesthood. I will review his arguments in this paper, showing that Gilpin is guilty of biblical eisegesis and actually uses arguments and texts that refute, not support, his Reformed soteriology and Trinitarian theology. Furthermore, as with many evangelical critics of the LDS Church, his presentation of LDS theology is flawed. When Gilpin is quoted, it will be indented and appear in blue. As many of his arguments are mirrored in similar other works against LDS theology, I believe this will be of some benefit to readers. In the Bible we see that eternal life comes from knowing Jesus. John chapter 17 verse 3 and this is life eternal, that they might know thee the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Already, Gilpin has used a text that refutes, not supports, his Christology why. Firstly, one should note that in Trinitarian theology, there is an allowance, albeit ambiguously, for a distinction between the persons of the Godhead. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father, as modalism would arise if no distinction was permitted between them. However, there is no allowance for a distinction between God, or any of the divine titles, e.g., Yahweh, Adonai, and the persons, that is, the Father is God, but so is the Son and Spirit. However, in many key, creedal texts in the New Testament, e.g., 1 Tim 2-5, discussed below, there is a distinction, not just between the persons of the Father and the Son, but also between God and the Son, which is very non-Trinitarian. This is the case in John chapter 17, verse 3. The Greek reads, O de estin he ineo zoe hina genoskos and satan monon alethanon theon kai hun apestolis ia sound Christen. Now this is life of the age to come that they may know you the only one who is the true God and the one whom you sent, Jesus Christ, my translation. The title, Tun Monon Alethanon Theon, the only one who is the true God, is predicated upon a single person, not a being composed of three persons, however one wishes to define person, and such is predicated upon the singular person of the Father, with Jesus himself distinguishes himself in John chapter 17, verse 3 from the only true God. Absolutizing this verse, this is a strictly unitarian verse as only a singular person is within the category of being the only true God. However, in Latter-day Saint theology, God is a multivalent term, something Trinitarianism cannot allow when speaking of true divinities. That this is the Christological model of biblical Christianity can be seen in many places, such as have 1-8-9. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness, and hated iniquity, therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness, above thy fellows. This is an important pericope for many reasons. This is one of only a few places in the New Testament where Jesus has the term God, Greek, Theos, predicated upon him. Others would include John chapter 20, verse 28, and probably, based on grammar, Titus chapter 2, verse 13, and 2 Pet 1 to 1. And yet, post ascension, Jesus is differentiated, not simply from the person of the Father, ambiguously tolerated in Trinitarianism, but a differentiation from God, literally, the God, Omicron Theos, something not tolerated in Trinitarianism. This can be further seen in the fact that this is a midrash of PSA 45 to 67, a royal coronation text for the Davidic king, of whom Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment, cf. 2 Sam 7. Both the Hebrew and the Greek LXX predicates God upon the king, and yet, there is a God, in the case of Jesus, God the Father, above him. The LXX reads the same as Hebrews. The Hebrew literally reads, Elohim, your Elohim alt. God, your God, Elohim Eloheka. Funnily enough, Gilpin quotes Heb 1 to 3 later in his article of verse Latter day Saints are known to appeal to frequently in support of our theology. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says, Who being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Unfortunately for Gilpin, this verse doesn't serve his theology well. Not only does the Christology of the entire epistle to the Hebrews pose many insurmountable problems for the more traditional, red, Trinitarian views of Jesus, as the author clearly held to a post ascension subordination of the Son to the Father, he also held to a theology of divine embodiment of God the Father, flying in the face of the doctrine of divine simplicity, God is without parts, an important building block for the Trinity. A careful, succinct exegesis of this text from the Greek was presented by D. Charles Pyle in his Fair Conference paper from 1999. I have said, Ye are gods, concepts conducive to the early Christian doctrine of deification in patristic literature in the underlying strata of the Greek New Testament text. There is also scripture that can use to potentially support the idea that God could have a physical body. One of these is Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. Christ could only be the exact representation of the Father if the Father himself possessed a body of some sort. In fact, some who wish to avoid what I feel is the plain meaning of Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 actually go so far as to separate the natures of Christ or declare that the passage could not possibly infer that the Father is embodied. Those who criticize this meaning thus, however, do not take into account the fact that there is not one portion of the passage that differentiates between the divine or human nature of Jesus. Secondly, the particle on indicates being, i.e., the present state of existence of Jesus from the perspective of the author of Hebrews. It has absolutely nothing to do with only Jesus' previous state or of only a portion of his supposed dual nature. It only speaks of his total existence as a person. Further, many grammarians have severely misunderstood the Greek apogasma apogasma, English, active, effulgence or radiance, middle, passive, reflection, in this passage to have the active sense. The Greek kai kai, English, and, is here a coordinating conjunction which combines the first and second parts, the second part being of a passive character, of a parallel couplet. Due to this fact, as much as the evangelicals wish doggedly to hold to their interpretation, the Greek apogasma apogasma should be understood as having a passive sense. Why? Because the second portion of the couplet indicates that Jesus is the exact representation of the Father's substantial nature, not that he is synonymous with that nature. Since this passage is a couplet, with the second portion being passive in nature, the first portion must be understood as having a passive sense as well. Thus, Jesus is properly to be seen as he, who is the reflection of the glory of God, and the exact representation of the substantial nature of him, i.e., the Father. In short, the glory of God reflects from Jesus rather than having Jesus as its source, according to the theology of the author of Hebrews. Thusly, Jesus exactly represents God as he exists in all aspects of Jesus' existence. The passage does not allow differentiation of Jesus' divine and human natures in relation to God. Quite the opposite is in view here, although I doubt that evangelicals will wish to agree with my assessment of the passage. Nevertheless, if it is true that Jesus is the exact representation of the Father's substantial nature in all aspects, the Father must have possession of a physical body. Otherwise, Jesus is not and could not be the exact representation of the Father, for the two would differ. This fact is further strengthened by another pertinent fact. The Father is never said to be bodiless in any place within the text of the Bible. That was for a later generation to develop. Returning to John chapter 17 verse 3, while much more would be said, it is clear from this verse that Jesus is the agent, apostle of the Father, cf. Heb 3 to 1. Further, John chapter 17 verse 3 is a problematic text for those who, like Gilpin, hold to creedal, metaphysical Trinitarianism, but not to Latter-day Saint theology, as the latter holds to kingship monotheism, wherein there is one most
Blake Osler, Of God and Gods, Salt Lake City. Greg Cofford Books, 2008, page 43. One wishing to pursue the biblical and historical evidence for the LDS understanding of the number of God should consider this scholarly volume. Examination of Latter-day Saint Soteriology. If we do not truly know Jesus, even good works that we do are nothing to Christ. Isaiah chapter 64 verse 6 says we are all unclean and our good works are like filthy rags to God. Knowing Jesus is what truly saves, not anything that we can do. It should be noted that the term translated as filthy rags in Hebrew is more potent within its Old Testament context. It means like as menstrual garments. Gilpin's comments notwithstanding, this is a prime example of how Reformed theology is built upon eisegesis, not exegesis, of the biblical texts. Firstly, Isaiah is speaking of the condition the people of Israel became as a result of infidelity to God and his covenant, not about the natural abilities of man, or total depravity of the tulip. This can be seen in the previous verse which Calvinists tend not to quote when abusing this text, one that speaks of the natural abilities of man and one's ability to please God with their good works. Thou meest him that rejoice and worketh righteousness, those that remember thee in thy ways, behold, thou art wrote, for we have sinned, and those is continuance, and we shall be saved. To blatantly ignore the previous verses to engage in the same type of scripture wrenching Jehovah's Witnesses are guilty of in attempting to prove that Jesus and the Archangel Michael are one and the same person. PSA 1820-28 speaks of meritorious good works and, based on one's covenantal fidelity, God accepts that person. There is no hint at alien imputed righteousness, any variation of faith alone, theology wherein good works is merely the fruit of salvation. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my heart hath he recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord, and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me, and I did not put away his statutes from me. I was also upright before him, and I kept myself from mine iniquity. Therefore, hath the Lord recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his eyesight. With the merciful thou wilt show thyself upright, with the pure thou wilt show thyself pure, and with the forward thou wilt show thyself forward. For thou wilt save the afflicted people, but wilt thou bring down high looks. For thou wilt light my candle, the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. Compare the above with a text written about David himself. For I have kept the ways of the Lord, and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me, and as for his statutes, I did not depart from them. I was also upright before him, and have kept myself from mine iniquity. Therefore, the Lord hath recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his eyesight. With the merciful thou wilt show thyself merciful, and with the upright man thou shalt show thyself upright. 2 Sam 22 22 26. This is the polar opposite of much of historical and modern Protestantism, not a hint of alien imputed righteousness, not a hint of the total depravity of man, not a hint of our works being menstrual rags in the eyes of God. Instead, David, due to his keeping the statutes and commandments of God, Yahweh will reward him, not based on an alien imputed righteousness which is the only ground of one's salvation, for reformed commentators, but due to David's own righteousness, Hebrew, LXX, Dikaiosine. On the use of the Old Testament in the New Testament, let us examine briefly a commonly cited and abused text in Rom 10 9 13. That is, thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This pericope is often touted as proof for sola fide, as it stresses confessing and calling upon the name of the Lord and the importance of believing in Jesus. Of course, Latter day Saints agree in the total necessity of confessing Jesus and calling upon his name. Epicolio is often a technical term in the LXX and NT for an act of prayer, and the importance of belief in Jesus, cf. Articles of Faith 3, for e.g. However, notice that things like repentance are not mentioned in this text, notwithstanding its importance in salvation, e.g. Matt 3 2, Acts chapter 2, verses 38 39, and baptism is not mentioned, again, notwithstanding its salvific importance in the New Testament, cf. Rom 6 1 4 earlier in Paul's letter. Moreover, Paul is using Deut 30, 6 16, a pericope that stresses the importance of obedience, not simply faith alone, when one is within God's saving covenant, covenantal nomism, for those familiar with terminology used within biblical studies, refuting the appeal to Rom 10 9 13 as proof of sola fide. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart, and the heart of thy seed, to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. And the Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies, and on them that hate thee, which persecuted thee. And thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord, and do all his commandments which I command thee this day. And the Lord thy God will make thee plenteous in every work of thine hand, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy land, for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over thee for good, as he rejoiced over thy fathers. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in this book of the law, and if thou turn unto the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul. For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is one not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven, that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us to heaven, and bring it unto us, that we may hear it, and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea, that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us, and bring it unto us, that we may hear it, and do it. But the word is very nigh unto thee, in thy mouth, and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. See, I have set before thee this day life and good, and death and evil, in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. I am sure Gilpin and other reformed individuals will claim that EPH 2 to 1, which speaks of unregenerate man being dead in their sins, is proof of their anthropology. However, such would only show their inabilities at biblical exegesis. The term dead in EPH 2 in parallel text is a metaphor. Trying to forge a doctrine from metaphors is precarious at best, eisegesis at worst. The term dead in EPH 2 to 1 5 is to be understood as a metaphor signifying one is outside the salvation of God and under judgment. It does not mean the reformed doctrine of total depravity, but T in tulip. The prodigal son is also called dead, in Luke chapter 15 verses 24, 32, but we know from the parable that the prodigal son willed that he would return to his father, again, showing the synergism of the biblical authors. Here, the working together of the will of the prodigal and his father, CVV, 18 to 23, it also shows that the son had some natural ability, contrary to total depravity. However, if I were to attempt to prove a doctrinal point from a parable as the likes of R.C. Sproul, chosen by God, are forced to from a metaphor, one would be engaging in very questionable biblical interpretation, to say the very least. That the biblical authors did not believe in total depravity can be seen in many places. One potent example is the case of Cornelius, a Roman centurion and God-fearer, a Gentile who associated with the synagogue. Listen to the descriptions of him before his conversion and entrance into the new covenant. A devout man, and one that feared God with all his house, which gave alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming into him, and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him he was afraid, and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a mem
23 24, Num 5 26, 17 to 5, 31 to 54, Dude 32 to 26. If any group can hold claim to being biblical Christianity, at least on this particular issue, it is the LDS Church, not Reformed Baptists like Gilpin. Other texts could be cited, such as Phineas being credited with righteousness due to his meritorious good works in PSA 106, 30 to 31, CF, Num 25, 2 to 8, Gen 15 to 6, and the clear teachings of the New Testament on the salvific importance of baptism, such as Acts chapter 2 verse 38, John chapter 3 verses 1 to 7, Titus chapter 3 verses 3 to 5, and Rom 6 to 1 4. As a Reformed Baptist, Gilpin would hold to the ahistorical and anti-biblical view that baptism is merely a symbol of one being saved prior to baptism. That such a view is contrary to the unanimous consent of early Christian authors is admitted by other Reformed apologists, such as William Webster, The Church of Rome at the Bar of History, Banner of Truth, 1995, pp. 95 to 96. So for number one, we see that biblically Jesus is completely and utterly God. Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 says, For by him were all things created, that are in heaven, and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, or dominions, or principalities, or powers. All things were created by him, and for him. The Greek reads, Hos est an icon to theo to aoratu, prototokos pesis katizeos, hodi en auto iectus ta panta en toi renwa kai epites jes, ta harata kai ta aorata, it thronoi it kiriotets it archai it exusiae ta panta di auto kai isot en ectus kai autos est en pro panta kai ta panta en auto i sinestekin, kai autos est en he kefil tu somatos tes ekelges hos est en archi, prototokos ectun necron, hina genitai en passan autos protuan, hodi en auto iudokis en panta poroma catwekis it kai di auto apokatai kai ta panta isot en, irino poises dia tu himatos tu storu auto, di auto it ta epites jes it ta en toi renwa. The NRSV renders it as follows. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in one him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. There are a couple of things one has to consider to engage in any meaningful exegesis of this pericope. 1. There is a differentiation, not just between the persons of the Father and the Son, but between God, Omicron Theos, and Jesus, VV. 15, 19, something which is inconsistent with Trinitarianism, see discussion above. 2. That the all things that are created do not include the spirits of man can be seen in verses 21 where there is a differentiation between the things created in VV.15-20, and you, Kaiwimas, that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled, something said to then believing Christians. Does Paul here include Satan and demons among this creation, when he says Jesus has reconciled all things in heaven and earth to himself? Highly unlikely, Paul could not have included unbelievers in this reconciliation, otherwise, he would not have qualified the prospects of reconciliation for his audience. If ye continue in the faith, version 23. I mention this point as some evangelicals, incorrectly, cite this pericope as proof of how allegedly anti-biblical LDS Christology is, e.g. Ron Rhodes, Christ, in the counterfeit gospel of Mormonism. 3. Relying upon the faulty translation of the preposition N in the KJV, Gilpin harps on the English preposition, by. Most modern translations, including the NRSV quoted above, translate the preposition as in, not by. It is possible this is a causal N, with because of him, being a plausible translation of the construction in Ottoe. See the discussion of this preposition in Moulton and Milligan's vocabulary of the Greek Testament, as one example. This is further strengthened by the fact that verses 0.16 is part of OT clause in Greek, OT meaning, for, or, because of. 4. The text states that thrones, principalities, and powers were created in Jesus. These are hierarchies of angels that are in view in this pericope, cf. Ram 8 38, that this is the case can be further seen in the fact that call 115 ff places this creation within the realm of all those things that God the Father is reconciling to himself, call 120, clearly placing a limit to the all things spoken about in call 116. 5. The voice of the verbs used in verses 0.16 when speaking of the creative role of Jesus are passives, not actives. Ectus is the indicative aorist passive of Katizo while Ectus is an indicative perfect passive. This would be consistent with LDS theology. Note the following from Bruce R. McConkie in volume 3 of his doctrinal New Testament commentary, 16 to 17. Christ created the universe and all things that in it are, but in doing so he acted in the power, might, and omnipotence of the Father. Worlds without number have I created, is God's language, and by the Son I created them, which is mine only begotten. Moses 133, by him, and through him, and of him, the worlds are and were created, and the inhabitants thereof are begotten sons and daughters unto God. D and C 76 to 24, John chapter 1 verses 1 to 3, Heb, 1 to 2. Such is reflective of the function of divine passives, where the Father is the ultimate creator, but it was done through the Son, and, in LDS theology, other figures, 2, cf. Abraham 4 to 1 ff. As N.T. Wright writes in his commentary on Colossians, part of the Tyndale commentary series, all that God made, he made by means of him. Paul actually says, in him, and though the word N can mean, by, as well as in, it is better to retain the literal translation than to paraphrase as Niv has done. Not only is there an intended parallel with verse 19, which would otherwise be lost, the passive were created indicates, in a typically Jewish fashion, the activity of God the Father, working in the Son. To say, by, here and at the end of verse 16, could imply, not that Christ is the Father's agent, but that he was alone responsible for creation. For in him were created all things in heaven and on earth, everything visible and everything invisible, thrones, ruling forces, sovereignties, powers, all things were created through him and for him. He exists before all things, NJB. In this scripture it seems fairly evident that the everything invisible includes things that already exist in heaven, such as thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. Further, the invisible things are also created by God, yet the fact that they are invisible means only that they are not seen by mortal eyes, not that they do not exist. The reference to invisible things does not address whether they were made out of pre-existing matter. However, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 18 states that the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. KJV. It is not difficult to see that Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3 neither expressly mentions creation out of nothing nor implicitly assumes it. The argument that the text must somehow implicitly assume creation out of nothing misinterprets the text and forces it with assumptions that are contrary to the meaning of invisible things. If anything, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3 implicitly assumes creation of the earth out of a pre-existing substrate not visible to us. 7. It should be noted that LDS theology does state that Christ is the Creator and often borrows the verbiage of this Christological hymn when speaking of His role in the creation. E.g. D and C 93 to 10. 3 Nephi 9:15, the 1916 First Presidency Statement, the Father and the Son, and such is not limited to the new creation, but also to the Genesis creation, contra biblical Unitarians. I raise these issues, however, as many critics of LDS Christology have falsely stated that Call 1, 15 FF refutes Mormon theology, which states that biblical theology presents Jesus as being the creator of the spirits of man as well as fallen angels, a category clearly not being reconciled to God, unless one wishes to embrace Origins eschatology. 8. In Call 119, we read, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Two aorists are used in this verse,
9. Verse 18 reads, And he is the head of the body, the church is the beginning of the firstborn of the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. This is nonsense in light of the hypostatic union which states that Christ was fully God, while incarnate, but only veiled his divinity. More on this later when we discuss Phil 2 to 5 11. However, this is part of Ina Clause in Greek, meaning that Christ became the firstborn of the dead, in order that he might have the preeminent, or supreme, protoon. On a related issue, it is often argued by Trinitarians such as James White, see his debate with subordinationist Unitarian, Patrick Novice, in 2012, that Paul exhausts all the prepositions in Coin Greek to describe Jesus as the Creator. However, this is not true. Strikingly missing is the phrase XO, from whom, used of the Father in 1 Cor 8 6, but never of Jesus. To understand the full force of the anti-Trinitarian implications of this issue for New Testament Christology, one will also have to exegete 1 Cor 8, 4 6. Peri tes brosio zaun ton idolothiton, oi daemon hodi odin idolon en cosmoi kai hodi odis theos ami highs, kai gar ipor eisen legomenoi theoi i en uranoi i epages, hosper eisen theoi poloi kai kirioi poloi, all hemen highs theos ho pater ex hu ta panta kai hemes i sodon, kai highs kirios iasu christos di hu ta panta kai hemes diado. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no god but one. Indeed, even though there may be so called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Firstly, the term God is predicated of the Father, and it is to the exclusion of the Son. Trinitarianism, the significance of which was discussed earlier in this post. Secondly, the number of God is said to be one, highs. In light of how the Father has theos predicated upon his person to the exclusion of the Son, absolutizing this verse as critics of LDS theology wish to do, e.g., Ron Rhodes, James Witt, et al., wish to do, this is a strictly Unitarian text, not Trinitarian. However, this is not an issue for Latter-day Saint Christology, as the term God is multivalent, as we recognize that the Father is the one true God, but there are true deities who can properly be called God, cf. Dude 32 to 79, Dead Sea Scrolls, PSA 29, 89, etc., something neither Unitarianism nor Trinitarianism in their various forms can tolerate. Another refutation of the Trinity comes from that of logic. In 1 Cor 8 to 6, creation is said to be ak, from the Father, while it is said to be dia, through, by, the Son. Again absolutizing this pericope in the way Trinitarians wish to do, let us examine how this pericope is another nail in the coffin of the claim that the Trinity flows from every page of the Bible. First premise, if Jesus is God within the sense of Trinitarian Christology, all things would be made from, ak, him. Conclusion, Jesus is not God within the sense of Trinitarian Christology. This is perfectly logical reasoning, called modus tollens. Not only do Trinitarians have to go against careful, scholarly exegesis of the Bible, but also logic. It should also be noted that many Trinitarian scholars argue that this text is not Trinitarian, but Binitarian, with this pericope, proving that Paul did not believe when he wrote 1 Cor 8, 4-6, in the personality and deity of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we live, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live, what Paul does, I call it a primitive Binitarian viewpoint. It's not even quite Trinitarian, I should probably clarify this for the listeners. I think there's a progressive understanding in the New Testament about who Jesus is, and when Paul writes 1 Corinthians in the early 50s, I think he's very clearly Binitarian. I don't know yet if he has understood the Trinity, my guess is he probably does not and those things get revealed a little bit later on. But here's the thing. There is no text in the NT that clearly or even probably affirms the personality of the Holy Spirit through the root of Greek grammar. The basis for this doctrine must be on other grounds. This does not mean that in the NT the Spirit is a thing, any more than in the OT the Spirit, a feminine noun, is a female. Grammatical gender is just that, grammatical. The conventions of language do not necessarily correspond to reality. One implication of these considerations is this. There is often a tacit assumption by scholars that the Spirit's distinct personality was fully recognized in the early apostolic period. Too often, such a viewpoint is subconsciously filtered through Chalcedonian lenses. This certainly raises some questions that can be addressed here only in part. We are not arguing that the distinct personality and deity of the Spirit are foreign to the NT, but rather that there is progressive revelation within the NT, just as there is between the Testaments. In sum, I have sought to demonstrate in this paper that the grammatical basis for the Holy Spirit's personality is lacking in the NT, yet this is frequently, if not usually, the first line of defense of that doctrine by many evangelical writers. But if grammar cannot legitimately be used to support the Spirit's personality, then perhaps we need to re-examine the rest of our basis for this theological commitment. I am not denying the doctrine of the Trinity, of course, but I am arguing that we need to ground our beliefs on a more solid foundation. For Wallace to admit that NT writers did not understand the Trinity implies that later 4th and 5th century Christians discerned and believed what, inspired, Bible writers failed to believe. This argument is therefore no different from the claims made by the very ones Wallace and others are trying to help since the Jehovah's Witnesses also proclaimed that Jesus and the Apostles didn't know that Jesus would return in 1914 CE, or that the first Christians did not know that the great multitude of Revelation chapter 7 verse 9 would be a second class of Christians gathered since 1935 with a different hope than the literal 144,000 anointed class of Revelation chapter 14, etc. There is absolutely no difference in argumentation, at least it can be safely said, considering Wallace's admission, that the first Christians did not believe in the Trinity formulated in the 4th and 5th centuries, that who and what God was to them was different from who God was to these first Christians. The implications of this admission are rather significant. While much more could be said, the purpose of call one is the preeminence and superiority of Jesus above everything else. Since the Christ event was understood to be the ultimate purpose of all creation, all things were created and intended with the Christ event in mind. Jesus' preeminence is shown in that he was intended before creation and demonstrated to be the firstborn of everything through his glorious resurrection. This could be seen in the locution in verses 0.16, Prototokos paces Kadiseos, firstborn of all creation, could be rendered as a genitive of subordination, firstborn above all creation, as proposed by Daniel Wallace and other Greek grammarians. See Wallace's discussion of the genitive case in his Greek grammar beyond the basics, an exegetical syntax of the New Testament. With reference to Esau 43 to 7, Gilpin writes, We see that this Old Testament God that created man for his glory, this Jesus in the New Testament created all things for himself. If Jesus was not God, he would be subject to the wrath of this Old Testament God as we see here. Firstly, one should note that Gilpin's comment, which is tied into his butchering of Paul 1, has already shown to be without any meaningful exegetical foundation. Secondly, if Gilpin, as a Trinitarian, will use this as a proof text in favor of his theology, it proves too much. Both the Hebrew and the LXX use a singular personal pronouns for Yahweh in this, and related texts, e.g., Esau 44 24. But in Trinitarian theology, God is not a singular person, but that the Father, Son, and Spirit, while each being numerically identical to Yahweh, are three separate persons. Absolutizing this verse, Gilpin will have to embrace, not Trinitarianism, but a form of Unitarianism. Continuing his eisegesis, Gilpin then ties Esau 43 7 with 42 8, where Yahweh states that he will not share his glory with a graven image, or idol, Heb. However, Gilpin's comments about Jesus being under the wrath of this Old Testament God reveals not only a gross ignorance about the context of Isaiah, see my discussion here and here, but also New Testament texts that speak of the nature of the rewards of believers in the
Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Dot, dot. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my father in his throne. Believers are promised to sit down on Christ's throne, which is the Father's very own throne. Interestingly, Christ sitting down on the throne of the Father is cited as prima facie evidence of his being numerically identical to the one God. See the works of Richard Balcom on divine identity on this issue. And yet, believers are promised the very same thing. This is in agreement with John chapter 17, verse 22, in that we will all share the same glory and be one with Christ and God just as they are one. Sitting in it does not indicate, contra Bowman, Balcom, et al., ontological identification with God. CF, Testament of Job chapter 32, verses 2 to 9, where Job is promised to sit on God's throne, something that is common in the literature of Second Temple Judaism and other works within the Jewish pseudepigrapha and elsewhere. Phil 2 to 5 11 considered. Gilpin uses an analogy from one of the Batman films to prove that Jesus' glory in his pre-mortal existence is the same as he now possesses post-ascension. He also takes umbrage with a comment from Joseph Fielding Smith. Here is a quote from 10th Mormon President Joseph Fielding Smith showing something of the LDS view of the nature of Christ. Christ gained fullness after resurrection. The severe did not have a fullness at first, but after he received his body and the resurrection all power was given unto him both in heaven and in earth. Although he was a god, even the son of God, with power and authority to create this earth and other earths, yet there were some things lacking which he did not receive until after his resurrection. In other words, he had not received the fullness until he got a resurrected body, and the same is true with those who through faithfulness become sons of God. Our bodies are essential to the fullness and the continuation of the seeds forever. Joseph Fielding Smith, Doctrines of Salvation 133. The problem is not between biblical and Latter-day Saint Christologies. It is between Gilpin's anti-biblical Christology and the authors of the New Testament. Let us do something Gilpin doesn't do, and exegete the text. And afterwards, out of theological necessity, one will have to discuss, albeit briefly, the overwhelming logical and scriptural problems with the hypostatic union. Phil 2-9 states that God also hath highly exalted Christ, and given him a name which is above every name. Here, we read that the Father gave to Christ, at the moment of his exaltation of the Son, a name above every other name, Yahweh. This shows that the Son did not possess this name until his exaltation, showing the ontological subordination of the Son to the Father. Also, it speaks of Christ being exalted, which is nonsense in light of much of Trinitarian theologies that state that Jesus was not void of his deity, but instead decided to voluntary shield it to most people, in effect, reading Phil 2 to 5 11 of the concept of kenosis, self emptying, and instead, perverting the Christology of the text to speak of an endusasthi or a clothing up. Furthermore, we know that this name could not be Jesus, as he possessed this name prior to his exaltation. This can also be seen in John chapter 17 verses 11 to 12. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one, as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. NRSV. In the above pericope, using prolepsis, CF, V.22, Christ speaks of how the Father gave him the Father's name, Yahweh. It was not something Christ intrinsically possessed until after his exaltation. Even after his exaltation, the telos of all glory and honor Christ receives are that of the further glorification of the Father. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Phil 2, 9 10, CF, 1 Cor 15 22 28. One should also point out the term, sometimes translated as exploited, in Phil 2 to 6 Arpagmos. Again, this points to something that Jesus did not have, as its predominant meaning in Koine Greek literature means to plunder or to steal. Notice how Lou Nida defined the term in their work, Greek English lexicon based on semantic domains, 2 Died. Harpazo, Harpagmos, OM, Harpage, SF, to forcefully take something away from someone else, often with the implication of a sudden attack, to rob, to carry off, to plunder, to forcefully seize. Harpazo, Pos Dinatitis Isolfain Ice Ten Oikian 2 Isheru Kai Tosku Auto Harpasai. No one can break into a strong man's house and carry off his belongings, Mount 12.29. Harpagmos, OM, that which is to be held onto forcibly, something to hold by force, something to be forcibly retained. Liddell Scott, in their Greek lexicon, abridged, offers a similar definition of this term. Harpagmos, ho, harpazo, a seizing, booty, a prize, nt. Such a Christology, apart from being one that permeates the entirety of the New Testament, can also be seen in the revelations of Joseph Smith, such as D&C 93-1617. And I, John, bear record that he received the fullness of the glory of the Father, and he received all power, both in heaven and on earth, and the glory of the Father was with him, for he dwelt in him. If Gilpin and other Trinitarians are correct, Phil 2 to 9 is utter nonsense, for how can the Father glorify Jesus and give Christ the name that is above every name? If Christ had this glory before the incarnation and even had it during his 33 years of mortality, the Trinitarian understanding of this verse is incoherent. In reality, post ascension, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily in Jesus, called 2 to 9, something we are also said to strive for, EPH 319. However, Christ is still subordinate to God the Father, 1 Cor 11 to 3, 15 22 minus 28, exegeted below. Furthermore, Gilpin is guilty of begging the question, what type of equality is in view? Functional? Ontological? Again, no meaningful exegesis is offered, this time of the phrase Isa Theo, equal to God. That Paul held to a subordinationist Christology can be seen in other places in his epistles, most notably his midrash of PSA 110 to 1, 109 to 1, LXX, in 1 Cor 15, 22 to 28. The Hebrew of PSA 110 to 1 reads, Yahweh said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool, my translation. The LXX, 109 to 1, renders the verse as follows. Ipen ho kyrios toi kyrioi mo kathau ek dexion mo eos in tho tu sectris su hypopodian ton potin su. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool, my translation. Here, the first Lord, in the Hebrew, Yahweh, says to a second Lord, Adoni in Hebrew, meaning, my Lord, to sit at his right hand. The only meaningful and exegetically sound interpretation of this verse is that the second Lord is sitting at the right hand of God, making him distinct from Yahweh, and not that he is numerically identical to the one God, a la Trinitarianism, though he does indeed serve as God's vizier, to be sure. I am aware that some, e.g., James R. White, have tried to argue that the second Lord is Adonai, not Adoni, but the LXX, the Targums, and other lines of evidence support the Masoretic vocalization. For instance, the Targums always interpreted the second Lord to be a David a king, not another, Yahweh. For more, see David M. Hay, Glory at the Right Hand, Psalm chapter 110 in Early Christianity, SBL, 1973, and Yaakov Van Zyl, Psalm chapter 110 verse 1 in the status of the second Lord. Trinitarian Arguments Challenge, in an e-journal from the Radical Reformation, A Testimony to Biblical Unitarianism, Winter, Spring 2012, pp. 51-60. In Trinitarian theology, as mentioned previously, there is an allowance, albeit an ambiguous one, for a distinction between the persons of the Father, Son, and Spirit, e.g. the Father is not the Son. However, there is no allowance for a distinction between God and any of the persons. However, the Christology of the New Testament tends to distinguish God, Theos,
but every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits. Afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign, till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, for he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is expected, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God, Theos, may be all in all. 1 Cor 15 22, 28. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, Theos, from henceforth expecting till his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. Heb 10 12 13. In both these pericopes, PSA 110 to 1, LXX 109 to 1, is used and expanded upon, and clearly, a distinction is made between, not just the persons of the Father and the Son, which is accepted, albeit, ambiguously, as the definition of person, is debated within Trinitarian circles, both historically and in modern times, by Trinitarian theology, but God, Theos, and Jesus, a distinction not tolerated by Trinitarianism, as well as showing the Son's subordination, even post-ascension, to God the Father. Finally, another example of the exegetically and intellectually weak arguments forwarded by Gilpin can be seen in his assertion that, in LDS Christology, Jesus did not humble himself in any meaningful manner. The truth of the matter, however, is that in Latter-day Saint theology, the pre Jesus was the God of the Old Testament, Messiah 3-8, 4-2, 3 Nephi 9-15, 11-17 is examples in the Book of Mormon. While Mormon theology does not recognize a species differentiation between deity and humanity, per any meaningful exegesis of Acts chapter 17 verse 29, LDS theology also recognizes significant qualitative differences between us and Christ, even in his pre-mortal state before being exalted by the Father, as Phil 2-5-11 clearly states. James D. G. Dunn, a leading contemporary Christologist, presents the following spot on analysis of the issue on page 110 of Did the First Christians Worship Jesus? Emphasis in original. In various passages, Paul uses the formula, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The striking feature is that Paul speaks of God not simply as the God of Christ, but as the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Even as Lord, Jesus acknowledges God not only as his Father but also as God. Here it becomes plain that the Kyrios title, Lord, is not so much a way of identifying Jesus with God, as a way of distinguishing Jesus from God. Latter-day Saint Christology, as well as the statement from Joseph Fielding Smith, is reflective of true biblical Christianity, not the post-biblical perversions that Gilpin and others, to their eternal detriment, embrace, cf. Gal 1, 6-9, 2 Cor 11-4, 13-14, etc. The hypostatic union examined. What Gilpin wants the text of Phil 2 to 5:11 to support is not a kenosis, self-emptying, but of clothing and endusasthi. However, the text of Phil 2 to 5:11 state explicitly it was the former, not the latter. Kenoa means to empty. According to Gilpin and other Trinitarians, Jesus retained the attributes of divinity, e.g., omnipotence, omnipresence, etc., and merely clothed upon himself humanity. However, the message of the New Testament is that Jesus was truly human. That this is the case can be seen in Mark chapter 13, verse 32, cf. Matt 24, 36. See also Luke chapter 2, verse 52, where Jesus did not know when the parousia, his coming in glory, second coming, would be. Interestingly, some scribes corrupted Matt 24, 36 to excise the phrase Ud Ho nor the Son, to downplay the Christological problems it would pose to their theology. The Net Bible, an evangelical Protestant production, comments thusly. Some important witnesses, including early Alexandrian and Western MSS opening parenthesis asterisk, 2BD theta F13% at VGIR higher, have the additional words Ud Ho Hios, Ud Ho Huyos, nor the Son, here. Although the shorter reading, which lacks this phrase, is suspect in that it seems to soften the prophetic ignorance of Jesus, the final phrase, except the Father alone, already implies this. Further, the parallel in Mar 13.32 has Ud Ho Hios, with almost no witnesses lacking the expression. Hence, it is doubtful that the absence of, neither the Son, is due to the scribes. In keeping with Matthew's general softening of Mark's harsh statements throughout his Gospel, it is more likely that the absence of, neither the Son, is part of the original text of Matthew, being an intentional change on the part of the author. Further, this shorter reading is supported by the first corrector of as well as LW1 Gilder 33 UVG Psychohirms. Admittedly, the external evidence is not as impressive for the shorter reading, but it best explains the rise of the other reading. In particular, how does one account for virtually no MSS excising Ud Ho at Mar 13.32 if such an absence here is due to scribal alteration? Although scribes were hardly consistent, for such a theological significant issue at least some consistency would be expected on the part of a few scribes. Nevertheless, NA27 includes Ud Ho here. Some Trinitarian apologists, e.g. James White, Sam Shamoon, argue that this was the human will, nature, of Jesus speaking or that Jesus, veiled, for a mysterious reason, his own omnipotence this one moment, but to claim such, and divorce such from the person of Jesus is actually counter to Trinitarian understandings of the hypostatic union and or to make Jesus deceptive, the person knew when the second coming would be, but only allowed his human will, nature comment. Furthermore, it results in Nestorianism or Separationism, two early Christological heresies, even by Trinitarian standards, where the humanity and divinity of Jesus are, for all intents and purposes, two people, not one, again, antithetical to Trinitarian, as well as Latter-day Saint, Christologies. The temptation scenes in the Gospels, especially, Matt 4 to 11, the fuller version of this scene in the Synoptic Gospels, portrays Jesus as truly suffering and being truly tempted by Satan. If one holds to traditional Christologies, Jesus was not truly tempted, as there was no real chance of him sinning, which, however way one cuts it, is docetic, i.e., Christ appearing to be human, but in reality, at least with respect to being tempted, was not, again. Such runs in the claims of Heb 2, 17 to 18, which necessitates Jesus' temptations to be real, but one that he overcame sinlessly. Interestingly, in Phil 2 to 5 11, cf, D and C 93 to 120 in the LDS canon, after the ascension, Jesus is exalted and given a name above all other names, Yahweh, Phil 2 to 9. However, if Trinitarian Christology is true, this is nonsensical, as Jesus was fully divine. A law the Trinitarian understanding of this concept merely veiled his divine attributes during mortality while still retaining them, and unveiled them post-ascension. Such results in an utterly deficient view of the humanity of Jesus, something which John warned against in 1 John chapter 4 verses 1 to 3, which Latter-day Saint Christology, especially in light of Joseph Smith's revelations and teachings, do not fall victim to. I'd say good post, but, um, well, it just wouldn't be proper now, would it? To give an idea how this problem is problematic, is Jesus, who is both omniscient as Son of God all-knowing? If he isn't, then the divine nature isn't present in him since the Son of God is essentially omniscient. Yet Jesus doesn't know the date of his second coming, so there is, at least, one thing he doesn't know. It follows that Jesus isn't both fully divine and also human, for no human could be omniscient given traditional assumptions. If as a human he is omniscient but doesn't know it, then he isn't omniscient after all. Is Jesus omnipotent? If he is, then he has properties that no human can have. If he isn't, then he isn't God. It won't do to say that Jesus is omnipotent he just can't exercise that power as a human, then he isn't omnipotent because he can't exercise his power, and he isn't omniscient because he has a power that he doesn't know how to exercise. To say that Christ, as human, is created but as a divine person isn't, is like saying that Fido as a dog is uncreated but as a mammal isn't. It is a contradictory assertion because nature's characterize the entire person. Such a penet
I am he. John chapter 8 verse 24. Jesus said, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. John chapter 8 verse 24. Do you really believe that Jesus is the great I am? The eternal glorious creator of all things who never needed anything, who never had need of anyone to give him counsel, who is eternally glorious. Latter-day Saints have no problem with acknowledging Christ as the great, I am, e.g., D&C 29-1, so this is not a bone of contention. One problem, however, I have with the appeal to John chapter 8 verse 24 is perhaps Gilpin believes this verse associates Jesus with Yahweh, which it does not, though verses 0.58 could be plausibly interpreted thusly. Most LDS exegetes understand John chapter 8 verse 58 in the term, I am, he. Greek, ego I me, as evidence of Jesus being God, the current chapter heading of John chapter 8 claims this has Jesus associating himself with Jehovah. However, I do wish to note that Gilpin's approach to this phrase in verses 24 is rather superficial. There are many instances of ego I me in the LXX and NT that do not carry any significance, e.g., the words of the blind man in John chapter 9 verse 9, or even when used of Jesus, is used as a messianic, not a divine, reference, e.g., John chapter 4 verses 25 to 26. This is more of a word of caution to LDS and non-LDS who employ the I am, sayings in the New Testament without engaging in any meaningful exegesis. All things are upheld by his word, by his word he calmed a storm, Mark chapter 4 verse 39, raised a dead man, John chapter 11 verse 43, forgave sin, Luke chapter 5 verse 20, healed the sick, Luke chapter 5 verse 24, and called apostles, John chapter 1 verse 42. This Jesus word alone carried more power than any church governmental authority, he has all power and authority by virtue of his nature alone. Again, without any meaningful exegesis, he leaves himself open to being easily refuted by an informed Christadelphian or another individual who rejects the deity of Jesus. Many of the miracles Jesus did, and many of the feats he performed, were mirrored by Old Testament prophets, but one would argue for their intrinsic deity. To simply say, well, it is Jesus, is to beg the question, thus the need for careful exegesis, something Gilpin seems incapable of performing, as this article proves. One example would be where Jesus forgives sins, Mark chapter 2 verse 7, and the people recognize that it was God acting through Jesus, the Son of Man, whom he had commissioned, to forgive sins, Mark chapter 2 verse 12, where the Father is glorified, not Jesus. See this, for an informed Unitarian approach to the issue. Jehovah and Elohim in LDS Discourse it is true that in modern LDS discourse, Jehovah is interchangeable with Jesus while Elohim is used of the Father. However, this has not always been the case. From the time of Joseph Smith onwards, there was a great level of fluidity in the use of these terms. For instance, in D&C 109 to 34, 68, the Father is called Jehovah CF, version 29, 47. But in D&C 110, 3 to 4, Jehovah is predicated of Jesus Christ. Interestingly, the name of the Father, as revealed in the Doctrine and Covenants, is not Elohim, a Hebrew generic noun, D&C 78 to 20, 95 to 17. In his diary for the 23rd of August 1842, Joseph Smith used Elohim, Elohim. O thou who seeth, and knoweth the hearts of all men, thou eternal omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent Jehovah, God, thou Elohim, that sitteth, as saith the psalmist, enthroned in heaven, look down upon thy servant Joseph at this time, and let faith on the name of thy son Jesus Christ, to a greater degree than thy servant ever yet has enjoyed, be conferred upon him, even the faith of Elijah. And let the lamp of eternal life be lit up in his heart, never to be taken away, and the words of eternal life be poured upon the soul of thy servant, that he may know thy will, thy statutes, and thy commandments, and thy judgments to do them. As the dews upon Mount Hermon, may the distillations of thy divine grace, glory and honor in the plenitude of thy mercy, and power and goodness be poured down upon the head of thy servant. Among other early LDS, there was a practice of predicating Lord, Jehovah on the person of the Father, such as the following. The Lord, Jehovah, hath spoken through Isa, 42, 1, saying, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth, evidently referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God chosen or elected by the Father, 1 Peter I, 20, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, to serve him in the redemption of the world, to be a covenant of the people. Isa, XLII, 6, for a light of the Gentiles, and glory of his people Israel, having ordained forgiveness of sins might be preached, Acts she, 38, unto all who would be obedient unto his gospel, Mark XVI, 16, 17, Times and Seasons, Volume 2, Number 21, Page 524. It is not the purpose of this response to delve into this issue, so readers wishing to delve further into this, see the following link in its corresponding bibliography. The Jehovah equals Jesus, Elohim equals the Father approach in LDS terminology is a modern convention, often to avoid confusion, especially as there are some Yahweh texts where only the person of the Father is in view, e.g., PSA 110 to 1, Isa 52 to 13, though in some cases, they are predicated of Jesus. For a full discussion, see, as one example, David B. Capes, Old Testament Yahweh texts in Paul's Christology, Moore Seebeck, 1992. 4. Jesus Christ the Father, by divine investiture of authority. A fourth reason for applying the title Father to Jesus Christ is found in the fact that in all his dealings with the human family, Jesus the Son has represented and yet represents Elohim his Father in power and authority. This is true of Christ in his preexistent, antimortal, or unembodied state, in the which he was known as Jehovah, also during his embodiment in the flesh, and during his labors as a disembodied spirit in the realm of the dead, and since that period in his resurrected state. To the Jews he said, I and my father are one, John chapter 10 verse 30, see also 17 11, 22, yet he declared, my father is greater than I, John chapter 14 verse 28, and further, I am come in my father's name, John chapter 5 verse 43, see also 10 25. The same truth was declared by Christ himself to the Nephites, see 3 Nephi 20 35 and 28 to 10, and has been reaffirmed by revelation in the present dispensation, Doc, and Governor 50 to 43. Thus the Father placed his name upon the Son, and Jesus Christ spoke and ministered in and through the Father's name, and so far as power, authority, and Godship are concerned, his words and acts were and are those of the Father. The logical and mathematical problem of creedal Trinitarianism. The priesthood of Christ. Many of the arguments forwarded by Gilpin are reflective of the arguments from other evangelical Protestant critics of LDS theology. So, for the sake of brevity, I will request the interested reader to pursue the following posts on my blog where his arguments, and those of other critics, such as Ron Rhodes, are answered. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 For there is one God, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. As with John chapter 17, verse 3, this poses a huge problem for Trinitarianism, as there is a differentiation, not just between the persons of the Father and the Son, but God, Theos, and the Son. Furthermore, let us examine this text and provide exegesis. Heis gar theos, heis kai masites theo kai anthropon, anthropos Christos iasu. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, my translation. The term translated as mediator is masites, and is used in the New Testament corpus to refer to an individual who inaugurates a covenant, which is what Jesus did. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator, Moses, masites. Now a mediator is not a mediator, masites, of one, but God is one. Gal 3 19 20. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator, masites, of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Heb 8 6.
derivative of Mesitao, to bring about an agreement, 31.21, one who causes or helps parties to come to an agreement, with the implication of guaranteeing the certainty of the arrangement, go between, mediator, Dietagus de Angelin and Chiri Mesito, the law, was put into effect through angels by a mediator. What Gilpin wants to read into this verse is that there is no need for human instruments helping people come closer to God, similar to Luther's claims in 1520 in the Babylonian captivity of the church against the sacerdotal priesthood of Roman Catholicism, and continuing to the present in many Protestant circles. The problem is that the New Testament evidences the use of such instrumentality, consistent with the LDS concept of priesthood, e.g., Matt 16, 16 to 19, 18, 18, John chapter 20, verse 23. Also, note the rather potent words of Paul in 1 Cor 4 15. For though ye have ten thousand instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel, and there are a plethora of Old Testament prophecies about the new covenant having an ordained. Ministerial priesthood, e.g., Isa 66, 18 to 22, Jer 33, 17 to 22, as discussed in my paper on the anti evidence of a new covenant priesthood. Gilpin is in the unenviable position of having to reject an ordained. Ministerial priesthood is part of the new covenant, which would mean if he was consistent, his rejecting Isaiah, Jeremiah, and other Old Testament prophets as false prophets. For a fuller discussion, one should read the blog posts linked above. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 23, and they truly were many priests, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. Old Testament high priests daily offered sacrifices to seek to atone for the sins of themselves and God's people. This was their most significant role. This role is now totally fulfilled and complete in Christ. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 24 to 28, but this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. 25 Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. 26 For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. 27 Who needeth not daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, and then for the people's, for this he did once, when he offered up himself. 28 For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the Son, who is consecrated forevermore. If Reformed theology is correct, and the penal substitution model of atonement, as understood by historical Protestantism as the biblical model, why does Christ have to intercede at all? Cf. Rom 8.34. In this model, the sins, past, present, and future, of the elect are forensically imputed to Christ, resulting in Jesus paying the legal penalty for their sins, however, this would render any intercession by Christ superfluous if Calvinism is correct. Note the following from Protestant theologian, Darren W. Snyder Belusic, Atonement, Justice, and Peace, The Message of the Cross and the Mission of the Church, Grand Rapids, Michigan, Eerdmans, 2012, page 249n. 13, which captures how unbiblical Reformed soteriology truly is on this issue. To understand the heavenly intercession of the Son on our behalf is the propitiation of the Father, as Michael, a Reformed apologist the author is responding to, does, generates a significant problem of internal coherence for penal substitution. According to penal substitution, the primary purpose and effect of the death of Jesus was to propitiate the wrath of God on account of the sins of humanity. As it is written elsewhere, because Christ is a priest forever in heaven, he always lives to make intercession, and is thus able for all time to save those who approach God through him. Heb 7 24 25. Heavenly intercession on our behalf is thus the ongoing vocation of the risen and ascended Christ. So, if the purpose and effect of the Son's intercession is to propitiate the Father's wrath, then the Son is continually doing in heaven at the throne what was to have been fully accomplished on earth at the cross. The cross would thus seem to have been ineffective, or at least incomplete, in accomplishing its primary purpose of saving humanity from divine wrath. Michael's interpretation of 1 John chapter 2 verses 1 to 2, although given in defense of penal substitution, effectively undermines it. Note the following from Swiss theologian and magisterial reformer, Ulrich Zwingli, that speaks of the propitiatory nature, not just of Christ's death, but his intercession in heaven, 1484 to 1531. For as he, Christ, offered himself once on the cross and again to the Father in heaven, so he won and obtained remission of sins and joy of everlasting happiness. Macaulay Jackson, trans, the Latin works of Huldreich Zwingli, 2 vols, 2, 276. A modern Protestant apologist also shows how easy it is for advocates of penal substitution to be inconsistent on this point. In the following case, a Calvinistic critique of the Catholic Mass. He enters into the presence of the Father, having obtained eternal redemption. Christ presents himself before the Father as the perfect oblation in behalf of his people. His work of intercession, then, is based on his work of atonement. Intercession is not another or different kind of work, but is the presentation of the work of the cross before the Father. The Son intercedes for men before the Father on the basis of the fact that in his death he has taken away the sins of God's people, and therefore, by presenting his finished work on Calvary before the Father, he assures the application of the benefits of his death to those for whom he intercedes. James R. White, The Fatal Flaw, 1990, pp. 133 to 134. This text poses great problems for Reformed theology, as do so many pericopes in the Old and New Testament when read in light of the historical grammatical method of exegesis. Why is this significant? In Reformed theology, when an individual is justified, it is an external, forensic event wherein the alien righteousness of Jesus is imputed to the individual, and one's past, present, and then future sins are forgiven. However, the New Testament clearly indicates that believers' sins are to be atoned for even after their initial conversion. Consider the following text. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation, Greek, ilasmos, atoning sacrifice, for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. 1 John chapter 2 verses 1 to 2. In this passage, Jesus is presented as a still present source of atonement for sins. Another significant text is Heb 2.17. Wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. There are a number of interesting things when one examines this verse. Firstly, there are two purpose clauses in this verse. The first, that he might be a merciful high priest, is the Greek ina clause. The second is the use of the Greek preposition ice, which means into, or with a goal towards, and this is coupled with the present infinitive form of the verb lashkamai, to make atonement illoskstai, and this present, making of atonement, is, for the sins of the people, Tasha marshes to lao. The author of Hebrews views Christ's ongoing office of heavenly intercessor as one that allows for the continuing appeasement of the Father to win the forgiveness of sins committed by believers, sins that were not forgiven at one's conversion. In other words, this verse presents Jesus as the heavenly high priest who, even at present, makes atonement for sins. This is alien to many theologies that think of one's forgiveness as being once for all. The author of Hebrews says Jesus makes atonement for sins on an ongoing basis. If one's then future sins were already atoned for when one appropriated Jesus, especially if one holds to imputed righteousness, and their justification can never be lost, this verse and its theology is nonsensical. However, Christ's ongoing work as high priest in the heavenly tabernacle is ongoing in reference to our own sins. Thus, the present infinitive form in Heb 217 conclusively demonstrate the continuing need for the application of Christ's work for our own salvation. Again, Gilpin and other Reformed Protestants are in the unenviable position of having to advocate a soteriology that is at odds with the witness of biblical exegesis. In the Great Commission, we see Jesus say this. Watch as this is massively significant. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 19. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. 19. Go ye therefore, and teach all. Ghost. Jesus said, All power is given to me, therefore
the Protestant doctrine and practice of sola and toda scriptura and the formal sufficiency of the Protestant Bible, a topic that has been refuted many times on my blog. I will happily challenge Gilpin or any other Protestant apologist to produce an exegetically sound case for sola scriptura, which Latter-day Saints reject, but which is the formal doctrine of the Reformation. It has never been done, even by the best apologists for the doctrine throughout the history of Protestantism, e.g., Francis Turretin, William Whitaker, Keith Matheson, William Webster, and will never be done as it is a man-made tradition. 3. Matt 28 18 states that Christ was given authority from God the Father. The Greek is Edo, the aorist of Didomi, indicating that Christ was indeed given such authority, not that he possessed it eternally and there never was a time when he had it but veiled it, for the hypostatic union, discussed above. Yet again, we see Gilpin abusing the biblical texts that actually refute his post-biblical Christology. This fits the Christology of the apostolic preaching, as record in the Acts of the Apostles, e.g., Acts chapter 2 verses 32 to 33, 36, 5, 31 to 32, cf. John chapter 5 verse 26, such preaching that is being commissioned in Matt 28, 18 to 19 by Jesus Christ himself. 4. In Jas 5 14, we read, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. The term elder is presbyteros, which is an office in the New Testament. See Cyprian of Carthage, Epistle LXIX, Basil of the Origin, Chapter 27, John Cassian, The Conferences, Part 3, Chapter 8 for early Christian discussions of Jas 514-15 and this anointing with oil being a priestly function. This is evidence against Gilpin's contention, unless he wishes to argue that the exact phrase, priesthood blessing, must appear in the Bible, in which case he is rejecting Saul Asterisk Scriptura in favor of Saul Asterisk Scriptura, putting him at odds with most Reformed Protestants, and also arguing like many popular Muslim apologists against the deity of Jesus. Jesus never said, I am God, worship me, therefore, Jesus is not God and should not be worshipped. Indeed, many recent works by apologists for Sola Scriptura have been written to offset this, Ms. Understanding of the Doctrine, most notably Keith Matheson's The Shape of Sola Scriptura, Reformation Press, Moscow, Idaho, 2001, which he labels Tradition Type 0. 5. Continuing with Jazz 5, 14 to 15, Latter day Saints can turn the tables on Gilpin at all. As we can point to this text because James appears to be giving a clear and dogmatic injunction that the church is to bring its sick and dying before the elders to be anointed with oil for the purpose of physical and/or spiritual healing, something that is rare in much of contemporary Protestantism. Why is this? On what sound, exegetical basis can this clear biblical teaching and practice be set aside? Only by privileging an external authority to the Bible itself can a Protestant meaningfully offer any response to this, showing that their claims to follow, authoritatively, so law scriptura to be questionable at the very least. This is yet another point where Latter-day Saint theology is more reflective of biblical Christianity than much of modern evangelicalism. Conclusion. Many other issues could be discussed, including the topic of ecclesiology, but the above should be enough to conclude that. 1. Latter-day Saint Christology and Soteriology are consistent with the biblical texts using the historical grammatical method of exegesis. 2. Reformed Soteriology and Trinitarian Theology, especially its Christology, as advanced by Bobby Gilpin and others, e.g., James White, are soundly refuted by meaningful biblical exegesis. Instead, they are later developments reflective of a false gospel, cf. Gal 1, 6 9. 3. In spite of the continued mantras one hears, evangelical Protestantism, including its reformed Calvinistic flavor, is not reflective of biblical Christianity. Instead, if any faith can be labeled biblical Christianity, on the topics of Christology and Soteriology, it is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. I do recognize that this blog post has been rather lengthy, but I do hope that it will help some honest readers see the theological and biblical plausibility of Mormonism.